Hello, welcome everybody to Connecting Knots HC Online. I'm Dr Julie Hankin and I'm going to be hosting today's session. So we've got a really busy agenda with a lot of people joining us. We will also have a Q&A session in the middle of the, the section, so do please put questions if you've got them into the comments bar. If we don't end up with quite enough time to pick up all of them, we will make sure they get answered afterwards. So I'm delighted to be handing over initially to Paul, our chair. Paul? Thank you, Julie, um, and uh, welcome everybody. Really, really pleased to be with you uh, again uh, for Connecting Knots. Um, sessions today, we're going to get a number of updates. We'll hear from John Bruin, um, uh, some general points, and then Anne-Maria Newham will be uh, giving us a CQC update. Uh, Dr Sue Elcock, uh, an update around forensic services um, and her perspective on those. And also we'll be hearing from Catherine Coucher on um, Concha on uh, Pride for this year. Um, just to say that this is going to be a monthly event for us. So really pleased uh, that we'll be doing these every month and that a briefing will come out after each one. So there's the question and answer uh, facility, the Q&A piece. Um, so please do stick your questions in there and we will hopefully get to answer at least some of them as we go through the session. So uh, I'm going to sit back now and hand over to John Bruin uh, to uh, give us the first of the inputs. John, over to you. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Julie. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to Connecting Knots. Um, I'm trying um, to multitask now because I've um, got about four inputs on my desk of all the fabulous stuff that I've been told to that I must communicate and it's great to be in such a position um, to be having to pick and choose but um, no doubt I'll be befuddle myself because um, I've got some written notes, I've got some type notes, I've got a screen um, and I've got to look at camera at the same time. Bear with. So the first um, piece, uh, a bit like last time, really, is give you a, a flavour of um, where things are nationally in health and care. Um, you'll, you'll be familiar, I, I think, probably with a lot of it in terms of um, some of the headline news that, that, you, that we've been seeing. Um, and the, the first point is that we're, we're, we're clearly now past the peak of um, initial COVID. Um, and we're moving into a relatively steady state as we as we enter that sort of tail. Um, that's not to say there's still a lot of illness and upset and challenge out there. Um, but nationally, um, we're entering a period of what's called restoration as we move into recovery. Um, a lot of that terminology is centred around acute hospitals and because we don't necessarily from a mental health and community perspective need to restore much because we didn't stop it and um, we, we continue to provide albeit in, a, in different ways and in different settings with the advent of digital and all sorts of different ways of providing inputs um, but from a national perspective I think it's important to, to emphasise that there's an awful lot of anxiety um, nationally in NHS England and improvement and Department of Health and politically about getting the NHS and care system back on track. The um, the last, what, 12, 14 weeks has seen a tremendous growth of backlog of work, um, whether it's elective surgery, access to primary care with long term conditions, cancer care, all sorts of things um, have been really difficult and it's proved much more easy to stop stuff than it is to restart it because we're all having to live with the need to maintain social distancing um, and that applies doesn't it particularly to wards to clinics to seeing people in their homes um, which means that the NHS overall capacity of its workforce to do the same amount of work previously is significantly curtailed and that's proving really really difficult just to give you one example of a stat that, that encapsulates that is that um, in the Midlands region, um, before COVID started, one of the key um, barometer measures of the number of patients waiting for elective care um, for more than one year, which ideally should be zero, 
and had reduced significantly down to just four for the whole of the Midlands across all of providers. It's currently standing at over two and a half thousand. So just in that, you give you a sense, just in that relatively short time, the massive, almost exponential growth um, in people waiting for inputs. So that, that whole um, concern and worry is obviously being dissipated through the systems that we're working in. And that's the background we're working at the moment. From a trust perspective, I'm, I'm confident um, that we're in a relatively good position. Um, and that's not to ignore the challenges that um, staff have to work with on a, on a daily basis. Um, but the, um, the observation that, that's clear um, to me and many members of, of the team and board is what a tremendous um, response staff have provided from right across the organisation um, during the pandemic. And their professionalism, commitment, dedication to doing the right thing for patients has just been phenomenal. Um, and it makes me really proud to be able to say that and um, to offer a thank you to everybody that's been involved in doing it um, because it, it's a huge task and we are going to be um, living with COVID for some time and we need to make sure that we stay agile and alert um, to, to manage um, things as they progress. Um, just a, a, a bit more um, detail on some of the specific things that I just wanted to um, tell you about. Sorry, I'm just, so I'm just flicking now. Um, you, you'll hopefully know that um, one of our principal objectives is to um, making sure that we support staff to enable them to do great things. Um, and so we've done a lot of work around culture and values. Um, and the, the values we're, we're, we're now um, encouraging people and teams particularly to get involved in a conversation about what those values of trust, honesty, respect, compassion, teamwork mean um, to you um, and what, what those values would um, prompt in terms of behaviours. Um, have a conversation with your team, write them up, send them in. Um, because I think it's really important that they're, they're not just words on the page, that we do live and breathe them and they're visible um, and, that, and that we can we can see um, how they impact on, on, on the work that we do. So that's culture and values. The, the second people-y um, bit is around staff wellbeing. Um, again, massive amount of work gone on in helping support our staff during the pandemic and some of this had started before. Um, but uh, just not, not to overwhelm you with stats, but in terms of the number of um, risk assessments that, that we've done, um, about 70% of our, of, of our staff have completed risk assessments, um, a large proportion of um, um, vulnerable groups, including BME um, staff have completed risk assessments. Um, and they're being um, looked at to make sure that wherever possible, we're making sure that our staff are safe and that we're taking appropriate measures to, to, to enable that safety to be um, carried out. Um, the second piece um, that we incre increasingly um, were challenged on just a few weeks ago was access to testing. So it's testing for the antigen, which is the symptomatic testing, and also testing to see if, if staff have had um, COVID at some point, and that's the antibody test. Um, we, were, we, we had a bit of challenge from the regulators because we were a bit slow to start. There are some critical aspects to that, that um, unless you've got uh, all the chemicals and reagents and a lab to do it, um, it's, it proves very difficult. So that, and there was no infrastructure to, to work that through. Uh, and that's now been um, sorted by our fantastic people in the, the people team. Um, and we are at about five and a bit thousand of our staff have had antibody tests, um, which is tremendous achievements. And we've been commended by the same regulators that are a bit itchy about it beforehand. So um, 
it's difficult doing it across organisations. It isn't just a single hospital. Across, we've got 140 outlets in five, six counties. We've got national services, got regional services, um, and the process we've been put in place has been commended. Approximately 12% of our staff have um, shown positive for antibodies, which is about um, the same as the national average which just goes to show that um, an awful lot of people have COVID without knowing it or have very, very mild symptoms. And again, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a unique to COVID, but it is a relatively unusual to have a single virus that can cause so much variation in response. Um, and, and that's, you know, has its own particular challenges. Um, what else I want to tell you about? There's so much. W one of the things that um, we get asked a lot is around um, this is all very well and good, but um, some of the problems prior to COVID was, was our um, recruitment rates and our staff vacancies. So some scores on the doors. Um, we've had 35 aspirant nurses and 20 TNAs recruited, 143 student nurses placed and 14 AHP students supported. Um, during this period. Um, so we've had um, significant recruitment into bank um, and my message to the, the extended executive team um, yesterday was that let's, let's really keep pushing with recruitment. Um, there's messages coming from the national team that uh, particularly in mental health and learning disabilities but in community services too. Um, there is a, a set agenda in the NHS long term plan to recruit, recruit, recruit. And we need to get in the mindset that um, we shouldn't be constrained too much by thinking oh, there isn't a budget. Um, we've got finances. We're expecting that additional finances will follow either through something called the Mental Health Investment Standard or, or other support as a result of COVID to make sure that we not only fill the vacancies, that we meet the expansion required to do some of the priorities within the, the national plan. So again, we've made a really positive, good start to this, um, and um, I'm really confident we'll, that we'll continue to do it. Um, the other thing I, I just want to say before, um, in the last couple of minutes of my, um, I think very meagerly allocated 10 minutes, um, you'll be all thinking, oh, thank God it's only 10. Um, is to talk about a, a little bit about um, the equality and diversity piece. So um, uh, I, I think, um, uh, well, I know I would like to commend um, the BME network for the work that they've done, uh, but also um, for the challenge they put in um, to me personally, um, to the senior leadership in the trust by essentially in, in a very, um, thoughtful and helpful way you know this isn't acceptable is it and from a trust perspective and from a from an anchor organization as part of the, the community of nottingham and nottinghamshire what are we going to do about it and um I, i'm fe again i'm feeling really positive and confident that um with some of the the skills and expertise within that group within the broader network within the allies community um, that we can start to describe how we can really move this organisation forward in terms of um, not just aspects of racism, which have been clearly described, but in terms of tackling bullying and harassment and moving to, to a much more just culture. Um, so my personal thanks to, to put on record for that. Um, and again, there's, we've got lots of statistics to support some of the great work um, that, that the BME group are doing. Um, and it would be remiss of me to, to finish without mentioning um, pride. Um, I know Catherine's going to do a, a piece on it towards the end, but again, um, it's, it's um, really proud that, that um, the organisation is hosting it on behalf of the ICS. Um, and it's, it's a really positive signal in terms of, um, for me, um, I, I've just been asked what, what it means to me, inclusivity. Um, everybody is important. Everybody should have an equal say and be able to feel that they can make a difference. And um, Pride is, is, is a really good example, the epitome of that. 
Um, so I'm really looking forward to, to hearing a bit from, from Catherine a bit later on with her rainbow background. Um, so I'm going to pause there because whilst multitasking, I can't see the questions that are coming in. And um, so I'll be able to have a look at the board and I'm going to hand over to whoever's next. Thank you. Thank you, John. My name's Anne Maria Newham. I am the Executive Director of Nursing AHPPs and Quality. Um, and it is my great pleasure to give you a very brief update on where we are with the CQC. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? So we had um, we've had several inspections, in fact, over the last few years, and of course the um, the full um, inspection uh, that we received was um, back last year and it gave us a, an overall requires improvement. Um, and in order to move out of requires improvement, we need to really start thinking about what does that look like for us, our patients, our staff, our service users. So um, the CQC routine inspections have been suspended during the COVID period, but then our return to business as usual, which was to be expected, and we thought that that would happen. It might not be exactly the same, and certainly they will be using a lot more um, MST or Zoom calls in order to um, continue. But um, at the inspection, the CQC check if we are meeting our fundamental standards of care, and these are really, really important standards. I've talked about them a lot um, over the uh, last couple of months, but these are really standards which uh, care must not fall below, and that is exactly what they look for. Um, and we won't want anything less for our patients and our, our loved ones. So um, we're doing a lot of work with the, with the divisions at the moment for them to ensure that they can apply the learning from previous inspections and inspections around the country of other organisations that have uh, received outstanding about how we can apply some of that learning to ourselves. So the number one prime priority for us is to ensure that all staff understand what those st standards are in the first place. So the other thing is I want to say this is our time to shine. I have a real passion for making sure that staff really, really see this as an opportunity. It's their time to really sell themselves, tell people what a fabulous job they're doing because Honestly, some of the work that we are seeing, some of the great examples of improvement across this organisation absolutely needs to be sold. Can I have the next slide, please? So, preparation is key. It's, not, it's very similar to when you're preparing for an interview, when you're preparing for um, some big occasion. It's all in the preparation um, and there is no point in us um, seeing the um, um, inspection as a surprise. We know what's coming, we know what they look for uh, and we know how therefore what, what we need to start thinking about getting ready. So when it comes to the CQC, there are certain things that they will start to um, really uh, want to see that we are doing well. Particularly around COVID, they are really interested in what has the patient's experience been like over the last few months. They're particularly interested in what have we done to patients that is different? Have we, um, have we stopped patients from doing certain things and what has the impact of that been? Are we doing risk assessments on a regular basis? Have we got something called blanket restrictions where we actually stop patients from doing things? So they're really keen to understand um, some of the things that we've had to put in place um, and uh, areas such as infection prevention and control, which we call IPC. So they're really keen to understand what we've put in place for that. So they will be looking for things around patient experience, infection prevention and control, maybe seclusion, segregation. Have we involved patients in their care planning and risk assessments? Um, are we ensuring that patients understand what we are doing to them and why we're doing it as well? So next slide, please. So in order to get ready, um, and I often say to people, this is um, red CQC ready is really how we should be doing it anyway. We should want to be uh, working in this way. We shouldn't be just doing it just because the CQC are, com are coming. We should be wanting to make sure that our services are the very, very best they can possibly be all the time. So 
these are little things that you can be doing across the organisation. Make sure you know what the last CQC inspection report said about your area. Really, really be clear about that. When the CQC come, one of the things they love is that if you can say to them, I know that this is what you found last time. What we have done about it is we have done these things um, in place. We've put these things in place. We've made these changes and that could be anything from uh, reports to um, estate to um, environment to things that you've done with the clinic, medicines um, and this is what we're doing going forward. So we know what you saw last time. This is what we've done about it and we're absolutely proud now to show you this. Um, if you haven't been inspected recently, it's really good to read some of the CQC reports from other trusts. There are some, some uh, really good examples. Northampton is outstanding. Um, East London is outstanding. Um, Tees Eskin Weir. Um, we've got um, our own Sherwood on our doorstep. Kings Mill um, came out as outstanding. So there are some really good examples of um, uh, reports that you can read as well. Also, we want you to be really clear and own what the CQC said you must and should be doing. So once they've produced a report, then we have to produce an action plan. And that action plan is really clear about the must and the should do's. And those are the actions that we now, now need to start really owning. And think about the great work you are doing. That's the story that we need to start telling them. So if they visit your service, don't be afraid of them. They're really normal people. They actually start with the premise that you are good. Um, so they want to then sh be shown all the things that you are doing that are good. So the other thing is, is that we've got lots of things that we can help to do to support you. We've got quality first pages on Connect. We've got a book of brilliance which has just uh, arrived today, which is going to go out to everybody. Um, and this will show the CQC all the fantastic improvements we've made. You can tell your manager if you're struggling to meet any of the fundamental st standards and why, so that that can be escalated. We're really, really keen to know what is stopping you, OK? So if there's anything that's stopping you, if there's any red tape or other things that are in place that are not helping you to do the job that you need to do, then we need to know that first. Um, and we don't want the CQC to be the people that are told. We want it to come to us first. Um, and we, um, we welcome offers of support from the Quality First Review team. Um, they will help you to understand what good actually looks like. Next slide, please. So these are the, some of the things that I've um, just described. So we've got the fundamental standards, your guide to. Uh, we've got the book of brilliance, which has been published and um, printed today. Um, and also we've got some guides. So there are five domains for the uh, CQC and we're producing um, a guide and a booklet after each time. And we've got fortnightly meetings that are going on at the moment, which a lot of team leaders, matrons, uh, heads of nursing are attending. And we're giving them some real good um, indicators, guides, guidelines and uh, tools to help them get ready for this inspection, which will absolutely will happen. Um, the other thing to, uh, to note is that if an area gets inadequate, they are um, required to be inspected within one year of the CQC last being inspected. So at the moment, uh, we do have an inspection going on. Um, yesterday and today, uh, CQC are in some of the adult mental health wards and we're getting feedback at the moment from that and we will let you know how that went and that will be part of the feedback loop that we will ensure is happening across the organisation. One of the things that the CQC do look for is that we are a learning organisation. So if one incident or one thing happens in one part of the organisation, that there is learning across all of the divisions um, to make sure that everybody knows about it and can learn from it. Next slide, please. So John talked about um, our um, looking at pride and what that means for us. Um, and actually my word, um, and the word that I really like is unity. Um, in times of working together around CQC preparations and what that looks like for us, our patients, our service users, that we can only achieve that if we have unity and we have a greater understanding together. Um, so that is my word um, and that's what I'm going to leave you with. I just want to say a huge thank you to everybody. I know that you're all doing a great job out there. Um, 
I also just wanted to say that I know that many of you have um, had mini inspections uh, over the last six months, whether that be a Mental Health Act inspection or whether you've had the CQC come in. Um, and I'm hugely proud of what you've all achieved because the feedback has really, really been very, very good. Um, myself and uh, some of the other execs, we meet with the CQC inspectors on a regular basis through engagement and relationships. And that is really, really improved. And they have some very, very nice things to say about us and, and us as an organisation. So once again, a huge thank you to everybody and what you're doing. Thanks, Andrea. So we now have the Q&A piece of this, this programme. So thanks to the people who've put questions into the, the question slide. I'm going to pick up as many of them as we can manage in the time that we've got before we hand over to Sue. And some I think I can answer and some I'm going to pass over to colleagues. So are two linked questions in terms of homeworking. One about our plans for bringing people back and whether that might be by Christmas. And another one pointing out that there are some real positives as well about homeworking and are we going to continue to encourage that? So I think picking those two up together, we're reviewing homeworking, we're reviewing that all of the time. I think it's might likely that we will move increasingly to a mix of homeworking and working in the office. But obviously the priority is that we have to be able to do that safely and maintaining all of the COVID restrictions. And the key thing is going to be about individualising that and risk assessments for, for each of you. However, the point is a really good one about the positives that also come from being able to work in this way and remotely. And I think we're fully committed as a trust to making sure that we make the most of that. And I think we will find that we're working in a very different way going forward. But we do want to see as many of you as we can, as soon as we can. It's much too early, unfortunately, to be able to say when that might be. There was a question then about retention of staff and in particular nursing staff. I'm going to invite Anne-Maria to comment on, on how we plan to do that. Yeah, we've done a lot of work around uh, retention already. Uh, what we found is that uh, with the COVID crisis, we had a lot of um, new members of staff, uh, staff that had left the organisation previously, um, had knocked back on the door and said, can we help? Can we come back in? I think um, I, I, I'm really interested in this area. I have a huge passion about retention. I always um, um, think about, you know, if you belong to the AA as in, um, car AA, uh, as in um, they always encourage new members, but they don't really look after their old members that have been with them for 20 years. And so I think that that's the area that we can do a lot of work with. And we have done a lot of work around retention and the importance of that. And what comes with that is stuff like development, um, giving people the opportunity to be able to express what it is that they need in order to be able to be the best that they can be for us as an organisation. So it comes with lots of things. There's not just one answer to this, but there's lots of areas around learning, development, um, supervision, appraisals, how people feel that they have got uh, ability to be able to um, uh, go up in their careers within the organisation. So these are all areas that we're currently looking at, but they are hugely important around retaining our staff that have got all of those fabulous knowledge experiences that we would like to retain. Thanks, Anne Maria. That's great. So picking up the next question, there was a question about training and the fact that we've had to reduce the amount of face to face training through COVID. And will we move back to that? So that's being reviewed at the moment and we're certainly going to be increasing the amount of face to face training. We're going to look to focus on those things that are really essential to make sure are happening. So things like resuscitation training, NDA. But what we will be doing is looking at more of a blend of e-learning and face to face and new ways of delivering. And I think like a lot of the things we're looking at now, we can really push ourselves to say, how do we use this change to push us into doing things in a better way and finding ways to deliver training that, that suit people better? So there's a set of questions about CQC inspections that I'm going to invite Anne-Maria to pick up. So Anne-Maria in particular, will the CQC be inspecting all areas of the trust going forward? inpatients, community, mental health and physical health, but also will admin staff ever be able to be included in those inspections? 
Oh, I love that question. Thank you so much. So I've just uh, responded um, to one of the questions around that. So what I've said is, is that we never know where they're going to inspect. They literally uh, make a phone call the night before and it can be anything up until nine o'clock at night to know where they're going to go in the morning. Um, but what I can say uh, with great certainty is if anywhere has uh, received an inadequate rating for anything, whether or not any of the five domains, then they more likely will be inspected within one year. If anywhere has not been inspected within three years, then yes, they're more likely to go there. I know, say, for example, some of the um, community health services have not been inspected since 2014. So there is a high likelihood that they will go there. Uh, with regards to people being able to have a say, we are really, really keen for all groups. It doesn't matter who it is, admin, anybody, cleaners, housekeepers, they can, they can take part within something called focus groups. So the CQC are keen to talk to all staff and they set up these focus groups. So there will be a focus group for housekeepers, a focus group for band fives, a focus group for governors. Um, and the CQC then meet with people and that um, gives uh, those staff no managers are there, no um, no execs are there, and it gives those staff the opportunity to say whatever they like to the CQC. And I have to say, I worked in an organisation previously where the focus groups were so well attended, that got such a lot of attention from the CQC, they were so impressed. The staff had some fantastic things to say, so it was really balanced um, and they had a really good view then of the organisation. So. No, we don't get to know where they go. We have a good idea based on ratings and yes, everybody can have a say. Fantastic. Thanks for that, Anne-Maria. So there's an interesting suggestion in the question bar in terms of the time to shine work that Anne-Maria was talking about and whether we include a slot in this session each month to showcase. I wonder, John, could I invite you to, to comment? Uh, you can. Unfortunately, I, I've, uh, my um, comment was in relation to the CQC bit, but um, from the time to, 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 which I was just about to say on, on the on my chat, I'm a bit behind myself. Um, time to I think it's a great idea. Um, I'm big. I'm a big fan of um, uh, enabling people to showcase the great stuff that they do because we are such a broad church that um, it's easy to overlook um, some great little projects or great pieces of work or quality improvements or innovation that we miss. Um, and a little sort of like a soapbox, two minutes, this is what the problem was, this is what we did. Um, I think that that's brilliant. And um, so just as a, as a PS to the CQC, um, it's just important that some teams get um, disappointed that they don't get visited. I know that might be difficult to, to believe, but the CQC are very precise about what they regard as core services. Um, and for example, um, something that we would regard as core psychological services is all the IAPT services, but the CQC don't inspect them. Um, and and the, the only opportunity for, is for staff working in those services is to access through focus groups or contact CQC directly. Um, but as Amory has said, we you know we do try and facilitate um, as many people as, as want to um, to have their say to the CQC because it is fundamentally important. Thanks. Brilliant. Thanks, John. That's really helpful. So just looking through some of the other questions that are coming up. There's a question from in regards to if we might see a second peak of COVID around flu season. Um, and obviously that relates hugely to our flu vaccination programme. And Maria, I wonder if you want to comment. Yeah, we um, were very aware that there is the possibility of a second wave. We are receiving regular communication from um, NHSI and the Centre and the Department of Health about what that could possibly look like. Um, there are plans in place, particularly for uh, the acute hospitals, about what they need to be putting into place now in case there is a second wave. There are no plans to uh, reduce the um, ability to be able to look after COVID patients. So the PPE is coming in as it should be. 
We are encouraging staff to take up their flu vaccine this year. We did really, really well last year. We need to do the same again this year. That will help all NHS services to reduce the amount of patients needing um, hospital admissions. So that's that's a small part that we can play, all staff can play in making sure that the NHS is not overwhelmed so that if there is a second wave that, that um, that's not there also. So yes, we are receiving regular regular guidance. We do know that there is the possibility of it um, and we do have things in place. Wonderful. Thank you, Anne-Maria. So I think we have time for one more question. So there's a, a question that's just come through that I think is an excellent one in terms of often new staff find it really hard to be integrated into the workplace, particularly when teams have been there for a long time and the difficulty of doing that at the current time. And is there a way of better integrating new staff and ensuring that we keep them? Sue, I wonder if you want to, to comment. Thanks, Julie. I suppose it's a difficult one because I'm partly in that similar position uh, just starting myself actually so it, it caused me to sort of reflect I don't I don't have an obvious answer and I think it's something we need to think about because often people in this trust have worked here a long time as you say it uh, and then to try to fit in if you're not used to that um, so I think actually probably put that back out for ideas if people have got ideas and what we learn from our exit interviews um, Probably. So I think it's something we, we need to take forwards and, and put into our sort of people work that we're doing. Can, can, I, can I just briefly, Please. sorry, it's John. Um, yeah, I think it's a really good question. Um, and I, 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 I'm with Sue in terms of, uh, we, I think we need to sort of have a bit of a conversation about what, what the answers are. But I, for me, I think there's something around um, thinking beyond induction. I, I, we have a, we have a Re until recently had, a, a, I think, a bit of an overly traditional induction where we give everybody everything on that first week and then just sort of leave them to it. I, I, I'm an ex exaggerating a bit, but I think there's something about, um, and I know that the, the, um, there are some services that I've, I've, I've visited that pick this up where they, where they identify mentors to help people settle over a period um, so that they've got a point of contact and um, and you can pick up any sort of initial teething problems and I think it's working something like that up as, as one area to work on but I'm sure um, you, there'll be many ideas about how we can how we can improve that really good question thank you brilliant so we look forward to hearing any suggestions on that as Sue says that really chimes with her situation so that's a beautiful link actually into the next section and Sue is going to introduce herself as our new Executive Director of Forensic Services. Over to you, Sue. Thanks, Julie. So, so compared to um, John's 10 minutes, I've got 15 minutes to talk about myself. So those of you who know me know that that's um, something I shall particularly enjoy. So, so I'm Sue Alcock. I have worked in the Trust before. Um, so next slide, please. So I don't tend to put much on my slides because I like people to actually listen um, and not be able to read it all. And I also think that that's the cutest baby ever and it's probably the most cute I've ever looked. Um, so I, I put that out there just to sort of share how I started in life. I came into the trust in 2002, so it's almost 20 years ago. Um, and I was really passionate about wanting to work in Knott's Healthcare. I wanted to do my training in forensic psychiatry and I was adamant that I wanted <laughs> Oh, John's just put something horrible. <laughs> Don't do that. I get distracted. You multitask. Um, and I, I really, so I remember going for my interview and it was in Duncan Mac in the downstairs and there was an interview panel set in a horseshoe table. Must have been about 10 uh, to 12 people interviewing for the registrar posts that I was going for and there was only one. So I was very pleased to get um, on the training programme and I didn't look back actually. So I um, worked across most of the forensic services as a trainee and it's really funny because um, I couldn't find a picture um, but people have been coming up to me recently going you look different but we do know who you are so I used to have very short dark hair so those of you who knew me when I was in that era it is me because I've had no end of people even yesterday Anne Maria and I were at Knott's prison and um, somebody came up and said I did work with you at Wells Road um, I'm sure so then I got my first consultant job um, and I worked at Rampton then for 10 years from 2005 to 2015 in the women's personality disorder 
um, stream, which I absolutely loved. I'd always said I never want to work with women ever in my entire life. And then when I actually got into um, the job, I, I have to say when I left, I really, really missed working um, with with everybody and the team. Actually, it was a fantastic team. Whilst I was there, I did quite a lot of work around education. That's probably my uh, sort of big thing that I'm really interested in. And I was head of school. I was training programme director for forensic psychiatry for a period. And then I had to make a really difficult decision um, about um, whether to stay in the trust, which I loved, which essentially I'd grown up in um, professionally and probably personally as well, actually a lot. Um, and in the end, because I knew I, I, I put it out there, most people who know me know I'm quite ambitious and I want to be somewhere that I can make a difference. Um, so I applied and I was appointed to be the medical director in Lincolnshire. Um, and that's obviously at the time that John was over there as chief exec. And uh, he, he tells a great story about um, the knots five, I think it was. I, I got confused with the numbers because then more of us started to um, go over and there was this sort of Nottingham um, crew, which were looked at really quite askew for a time. It's quite interesting. So then the medical director job in Leicester came up. And um, so I spent about three and a half years in Lincoln and then I moved to the job in Leicester because again, different portfolio, very different um, uh, role, which I really enjoyed doing. Um, and then when this post came up, um, I thought that's that's a real good combination. It's a good combination because I'm passionate about forensic psychiatry, absolutely, and its services and what it can provide and how. Um, but I'm also passionate about the trust. Um, and so actually it has felt to a degree like coming home. Um, so. And it's interesting because I think there's this thing being said about sort of all these people coming from Lincoln, but actually we all started in Nottingham. So I just wanted to put that out there. Can I have the next slide, please? I know you'll be sad to see the baby go, but. Thank you. So that's a bit about who I am and this is about who are we? What are, what are the services? Because actually the forensic division itself is actually a lot more diverse than um, I think we sometimes sort of appreciate. So I won't go around particularly, but obviously we've got our um, levels of secure hospitals. We've then got our community forensic, but we've got a whole array of prison um, health care that we provide where we provide uh, mental health. Um, people keep putting things in the thing and I get distracted. I'm going to turn it off. Um, physical health, mental health and substance misuse. So we provide all three elements of healthcare in those prisons, which is very different. And then Morton Hall, if I just pick that out separately, um, is an immigration removal centre. So it's actually completely different. It isn't a prison in any way, shape or form. And I, I have to say I visited it on Tuesday and I'm not appreciated exactly what the differences were. Um, and obviously um, we've now heard about um, some proposed changes to Morton Hall and staff are being supported about what that will mean. Um, so that's sort of just to give you a flavour that we're not quite as simple as I think some people might think. Uh, right, if we move on again, please. So I thought I'd do a bit about um, sort of me a bit more personally. Um, so I, as you see, I, I'm quite visual. Um, so the first one is about me being really black and white and it's about I'm really honest. Um, so that's meant to be the transparent bit of that. Um, I've, I do it with the right. Um, I'm always really clear that it's about being fair. So I'm always honest and if you ask me something, I'll give you an honest answer um, and I would never ask anybody to do anything that I wouldn't be willing to do as well. That's sort of some real key things um, that are important to me actually personally. Um, the one in the middle, I learned all about emojis when I was doing this presentation because I am getting a bit old and electronic stuff, I think, has passed me by slightly. So the middle one is an emoji for having fun. Uh, it's, no, I've gone too far. It's for working hard. That was it. So that one's about working hard. So I like to work hard and I have high expectations. Um, again, those of you who know me know that. Um, but then to do that, it's really important that we have fun as a team. So that one there with all those little yellow things is about the team, because whenever I've worked in a good team, we have fun together and that's how you know that, you know, it, you're, you're working. Um, in terms of then just me a bit more personally, so I love going on cruises. I know that makes me sound very old, but I take my mum on a cruise every so often and we have great fun. 
The boxing gloves are because recently in COVID, once we were sort of out of the first bit of isolation, my previous personal trainer started to advertise boxing sessions in the park. So I've been really enjoying doing that. And then the cake is because again, those of you who know me know I love cooking and my kitchen got taken out at the beginning of March. So next one. So it was a bit of a balance because I can talk a lot. So just thinking a little bit about the forensic division. Um, I've been in there now, it's week eight. Um, so I've talked about the diversity of it, um, but I think we also need to have a clear identity um, within the trust banner of what is the forensic division, what is the senior forensic divisional management team, for example, and we need to change some of our structures and um, things. Anne Maria talked about barriers, you know, and just get rid of them if they're there. So that's a picture of Spaghetti Junction because I used to live in Birmingham um, many moons ago. And um, some of some of our meeting structures and governance are a bit like that, which then gets in the way of seeing the overall picture. I think we also need to think about um, historically the divisions had a lot of competition between its services and um, not necessarily always felt worked together. So I think a degree of healthy competition is fine, but actually it's about learning and supporting um, across the piece. Um, in my interview, and I do passionately believe this, I think in forensic services we used to be better at patient involvement in a really meaningful way than perhaps we've necessarily motored on more recently. I think that echoes something that John was saying. And the other thing that I also have um, thoughts around is just restrictive practices and how how um, how much that's changed since I left five years ago, actually, in terms of quantity in particular. So so that's some of the things that I think we need to look at. Um, and I think we're already starting to do some of that work and make some of those changes. Um, so, for example, the governance review we've kicked off this week to make our lives simpler so we can get on with actually what we're here for. So my next one, um, if we can do the next slide. I felt a bit slightly naff putting this up, but actually what I want is for all of us um, in the forensic division to be proud. I was so proud when I worked here. Um, and I think we all need to get and I, I feel it. I'm feeling it already. There's a lot out there where areas and people, colleagues are proud, but we need it to, to be for everybody, which does then link to my word for um, pride. Now, I know a lot of people might think, why is she talking about talking rather than doing something? But actually, when um, I read that the question that was asked of us about what's your word, it took me to a point where I remember us starting to talk about this in the women's service and actually talking about the fact that we didn't talk about patient sexuality. Um, you know, and actually, if patients started to express their sexuality, it was almost seen as um, pathological, actually, and not something that, you know, could be openly talked about. And that was because we were all really uncomfortable and didn't know how to talk about it. So that's why I've put talking because it just triggered. Um, and for me, that's that's more of what, what we need to do because that's an action in itself. So I think I'm just on time. I might actually have talked quicker than I thought. Um, do you want, am I on time? Do you want me to do any questions? Right. So I've got a question about um, Julie H. You're on mute. Sorry, I was talking away there as host and on mute, as John's just kindly pointed out to me. So I really am not doing well with this today. Sue, there are two questions that have come up in the chat bar. They may be slightly more than you've got time for. One is about your specific vision for Rampton Hospital and one relating to the changes at Morton Hall and what you're able to share. OK, I'll do the changes to Morton Hall because factually, um, so staff were informed yesterday we um, because obviously uh, um, it's we are subcontracted to provide a service. It was to the health and uh, justice team to say. And so their proposal is that within the next year it will likely to change to a male category C prison. What that means in terms of health care, we're not sure of, but obviously we're, we are supporting and people were there yesterday to help start and talk to the um, the healthcare team. So I had some feedback last night that people are feeling um, really positive because you know there are lots of opportunities within both offender health and in the wider trust, um, given questions that we were just talking about for recruitment and retention. 
as well. Vision for Rampton Hospital, gosh, that's a big question. I mean, I one of the things that we're looking at at the moment is just how it's managed um, and how we get a collective sort of senior management team um, and how we get a lot better at um, involvement rather than a sort of top down approach potentially and how we actively involve everybody and be really clear on everybody's joint purpose. So one of the things that people will have heard me talk about potentially elsewhere is I I think we've got really siloed at Rampton in particular. And so instead of having um, the idea that we'd start with this is a group of patients, what are the patient needs? How do we best provide that? Um, we've got really stuck into our, our very much professional silos, I think. Um, so those are just some early thoughts, but whoever asked the question, because I can't, I've, I've closed my bars as I can't see it. Um, if you've got ideas and things in particular, do feel free to just ping them across, um, you know, offline by email or whatever. So, all right, is that all the questions? So, so I'm afraid we, you do still have a minute or so, and there is another question popped through as you're talking. So clearly people are out there listening to us, which is great. Sue, where do you see involvement improving going forward? So I've had quite a lot of discussion already with um, Paul and Nigel about it because we've talked about, um, so for example, um, we've got individual forums across the different streams, we've got patients council um, and when you look at it, so for example at Wells Road they have um, an advocate on their senior management team um, and that's been agreed and that's how the patients like to um, to be represented. So I think it's learning what's going well, where it's not. I mean, Wathwood, if you look at um, how they've been able to engage particularly um, and get patients at the front going out doing um, presentations, for example, historically. So I think there's a lot that we could think about, particularly then about um, how you give better um, sort of pre-work opportunities as well. So, for example, do we have the right types of um, I'll use the word volunteer, but it might not be the right sort of word, but you know, so have we got areas where we could get more patients involved with, you know, shops, um, catering, you know, all those sorts of things to prepare people um, for moving on. Um, so those are some really early ideas, but again, it's very much open. So if people have got other ideas as well, um, that would be great. Fantastic. Thanks, Sue, and welcome. We're all really pleased to have you have you back with us. So I'm going to pass on to Catherine Conchar now, who's going to talk to us about pride and diversity. Catherine. OK, thank you, Julia. Um, as Julia said, I'm Catherine Conchar, Associate Director of the Court and Diversity, and I'm delighted to talk to you during Pride season about the importance of pride and support and diversity. So can I have the third slide, please? In the early hours of the 28th of June 1969, the New York Police raided the Stonewall Inn, a club located in Greenwich Village. The raid sparked a riot amongst bar patrons and neighbours as residents and police were roughly hauled by the police onto the, sorry, as residents and police entered the bar and roughly, and roughly hauled employees and patrons outside, leading to six days of protests and violent clashes with the law. A this is in neighbouring streets and the nearby Christopher Park. Of course, the Stonewall riots weren't the start of LGBT plus history or of LGBT people fighting against humanity and humanity, oppression and justice. They were simply a point of origin of forces coming together, enabled by the political and social circumstances of the time. One of the protesters described how spontaneous the whole thing was. We all had a collective feeling that we had enough of this kind of shit. It wasn't anything tangible anyone said to anyone else. It was just that everything over the years had come to head in that one particular night and in that one particular place. And it wasn't an organised demonstration. Everyone in the crowd felt that we'd never, there was no way we could ever go back. It was like the last straw for us. It was time to claim something that had always been taken from us. All kinds of people, all different reasons, but mostly it was total outrage, anger, sorrow, everything combined. And we felt that we had freedom at last a freedom to at least show that we demanded freedom. So does this remind you of anything? Not the same, but some similar experiences that people of colour face each and every day. And if you're an LGBT plus person of colour, you can sometimes be doubly diverse and doubly damned. The Stonewall riots served as a catalyst for the gay rights movement in the United States and in the world, 
and within two years were gay rights groups in every major American city, as well as Canada, Australia and Western Europe. In June 1970, the first gay marches took place in New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco and Chicago, commemorating the anniversary of the riots. In 1971, Pride marches took place in Boston, Dallas, Milwaukee, London, Paris, West Berlin and Stockholm. So slide four, please. So let's look at Pride 50 years later in Nottinghamshire. Many of you know that Nottingham is known as the Queen of the Midlands and it's got absolutely nothing to do with Her Majesty. There's a rich LGBT plus history in Nottingham and Nottinghamshire, and that's wonderfully collated and preserved by the Nottinghamshire Rainbow Heritage. There's amazing work happening in schools and youth services to support young people in employment and services, trying to ensure that no one has to go through the pain and agony that many have faced in trying to be their authentic self, of loving who they love, about being accepted without exception. I want us to remember Nottinghamshire pride, not only last year's, but way back to the first Pride in 1999, 20 years ago last year, where we proudly marched as individuals with our unique and individual differences and diversities, but where we together as one, members of a community and allies standing side by side. They were friends, family, spouses, partners, colleagues, and indeed total strangers. People proud of who they are. Unions, councils, housing, health, police, fire, sports teams, human beings and canine companions all marching under one flag, one identity for a glorious day, one community, one humanity. Slide five, please. So what has changed? There's now same sex marriage, fostering adoption for same sex couples, legislation that protects and no longer censors, employers and service providers taking action and young people with less historical baggage unlike some of the older LGBT people. So if much, so much progress has been made, why do we still need pride? Why do we still need labels? Why do we still need to talk about LGBT stuff? Slide six, please. Because it's not all rainbows and unicorns. And besides, all of this progress is about having the same rights and experiences that many other human beings already have. Gay, bi and trans people are still subject to conversion therapies, including electric shock treatment in some countries, including the UK, to make them normal. Not in the NHS, I might add. But well, a recent Stonewall report suggested that 52% of LGBT plus people experienced depression in the last year and 61% anxiety to compared to 17% of the general population. In the last months, more than one in 10 trans people attempted to take their own life compared to 2% of LGBT people who aren't trans. Gay, bi and trans people in many situations have to act straight or assist gender to protect themselves from being disowned by their family and friends, abused and tortured, sometimes being forced into hiding or into traditional marriages. Slide seven, please. So how can you make a difference? How can you help make Knott's Healthcare a better place for all of our staff and those who use our services? We all have different things to contribute to achieve our common goal, to create a home, a school, a workplace, a city, a country, a world where LGBT equality is the norm. To again use Stonewall's motto, acceptance without exception. These are some of the things that you can do. Pledge to be an LGBT ally and wear your rainbow lanyard. Join our ICS virtual pride event on the 29th of July. Champion equality, diversity, and inclusion in your place of work, home and community and join the Sexual Orientation Steering Group and Gender Equality Steering Group to help make Knott's Healthcare a better place. Final slide, please. So I was asked in one word what pride means to me, and this is nothing to do with Braveheart, I can assure you, although it does have a little bit of an influence. Freedom. Freedom to be your authentic self. Freedom to love and be loved. Freedom to be the best that you can be. Freedom to be valued and accepted and freedom to feel normal. All I can say now is happy Pride and thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Catherine. That was a fantastic presentation. And in some ways, I'm very glad we put you at the end because I don't think we would have been able to follow that with something else. So thank you for the challenge and the push and we will continue to hopefully live up to it. 
So can I thank all the presenters, please? It's been a really good session. I hope you've all enjoyed it as much as I have. I think we've had a good mix of subjects and it's been great to have the questions coming in and being able to interact during it. Thank you for all that you are doing out there. Our next meeting of these will be on the 18th of August at 1.30. And again, please do put questions in on the day or you can email them to staff engagement ahead of time. So thanks to all of you for all that you're doing every day for us and we look forward to seeing you again. Bye.